Okay, starting recording. Starting recording with the view of last night's scene of where we are in the printers. So that's last night, organizing things. Um, looks pretty nice. So the theme of this this theme camp is uh, learning about gener generic design. We're, we've covered, just touched on basics of frames, controllers, and universal axes as some of the core 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 components. And I'm going to cover just a little bit about the universal controller, which we're going to get out into the bu actual build here in real life. So let's go over what the universal controller does. So there's a document, once again, under design guide, OSC machine design guide. Let me paste that into for everybody to see for the remote people. And anyone who misses this can also view this as a recording. Machine design guy, we go to the <clears throat> universal machine controller, which is actually lesson number five. Let's take a look at that. And let me share my screen with people remotely. Sharing. Okay, universal machine controller. Okay, um, the universal machine controller, the essential idea here is that we've got the 3D printer with a pretty robust kind of a generic controller called RAMPS, RepRap Arduino Mega Control, RepRap Arduino Mega Palolu Shield, which when generalized with some other components can be used for a wide variety of applications. So this is an automation controls, CNC machine design. Um, and if you know how to configure it, basically work with this uh, semi-document. It's decently well documented at Marlin for Google Marlin firmware. That's the, the firm, firmware software side. And then there's a hardware system of the universal controller. So I'll, I'll, uh, we can look that up on the wiki. The best, best place to look at what has been built on a controller is, is the 3D printer version 1904. And that is D3DV 1904 page on the wiki. There's the, the documentation that we have so far. Uh, let me paste that in. Um, so universal controller. Let's take some pictures, take a look at some pictures of it. The current implementation is in a, on a 3D printer, we have done a control panel where we just took a piece of plexiglass and added all the electrical control systems to that. Uh, and part of that was, okay, you gotta measure all the holes, drill them uh, in a piece of plexiglass. A piece of plexiglass costs you $6. You have some time in terms of the drilling and, and then zip tying components. So we thought, okay, well, why don't we just have that 3D printed? 3D printed, please, and then you can attach the components readily because with 3D prints you can you can put all the holes into. <clears throat> hey William, can you help me out by putting all the stuff that I'm looking at mirroring me on the on the screen? Sure. But the concept being, let the machine do the work for you. No need to measure. As I mentioned, that measuring things is the hard part. It actually takes more time than actually doing the drilling or um, drilling or cutting. So you save yourself the time and you're guaranteed to have a, a, a good result because it's computer controlled unless you have a bug in the code uh, you're going to do this right because the file will be verified uh, to work and and so forth so what do we do <clears throat> uh, what do we want to design into this controller you've got the RepRap Arduino Mega Pololo Shield brain you need a power supply we have added an, a ground fault connection interrupt protector into that because now we're running the bed we're allowing the system to run either 12 volt loads or 120 volt loads or any any volt loads by adding relays onto this control panel yeah, if you wouldn't mind opening up there no the ground fault connection interrupter is incompatible with grounding you either have grounding or ground fault well no you can have both but then you need you can do both yeah 
Having grounded the frame at this point, we, we could do that. That's, that would be an easy thing. But for ground, uh, ground fault circuit interrupters, why do you not have a, a ground pin there? The ground pin there is not active. Um, because it works in a different way. It looks for a voltage between ground and neutral. Yes, you have what a ground fault circuit interrupter does is it measures that the current is flowing and nothing is leaking out. As soon as it detects any type of tiny leak, like on micro, like milliamps or something very tiny, it will shut off the entire system. It has a, it's actually a, an advanced controller circuit inside. It's an integrated circuit inside the ground fault connection interrupter, which switches off. So, for example, if you touch a part that's been exposed, like a hot wire, and the relevance there is we have a 120 volt heat bed. Say there's any break in the system. Say you touch it, it shuts it off immediately before you get shocked. So this is, uh, it's the thing, the kind of interrupter that you have in bathroom outlets, because bathrooms are wet environments, there's a higher risk of hazard there, uh, or kitchens. We're putting that right on a control panel uh, because it makes it literally impossible to get a shock out of the system, since it will, sh it will uh, turn itself off before doing anything. Now there are cases, of course, where it doesn't protect you, and that would be, I believe, when you touch, there are cases like when you touch, what is it, both the hot and ground and neutral at the same time, which, you know, is possible, not likely. You have to be really doing something, something about. Yeah. So for practical effects, you can say the ground fault is 100% foolproof way, even if you have novices, uh, you have an electrical system at high voltage, 120 or 240, and they're perfectly safe with that. So it's a, that's a good design thing because if we didn't have that, you know, I was thinking about that, okay, yeah, people are gonna be getting shocked left and right, we've got open source blueprints. Of course, we have a disclaimer, do not do this, it can kill you, but for those people that do that anyway, um, they are safe on the electrical side. Uh, are you pulling which this one? up? Yeah, which one are you? Go to the uh, D3DV 1904 page. We have some pictures of that, so let's let's show that on a screen. So the 3D printer control panel has several features. One, the first problem statement was like, well, how do you print a control panel? It's as big as the printer because it spans like a whole face of a printer. Well, the print bed is smaller than that. Uh, so at first you, th you think you can't do it, but yeah, you can. So we print it at a 90 degree angle so you can flat straighten it out. Um, I don't have one here, but... Um, what we do is we print the control panel bent at a right angle with hole perforations along that bend So you can take a heat gun to that and simply bend it out to a, a structure that's like larger than the printer itself That's convenient for you to be able to get larger structures from a limited size print bed um, That's also called four-dimensional printing because you're adding the temporal dimension to that so you have 3d as far as 3d shapes but you got the fourth dimension as far as in terms of time. So scroll down to the Facebook page, uh, control panel build. So on Facebook, posted these pictures. Uh, take a look at some of them, go all the way down. Um, and then, that's, that's a decent idea, idea for what it looks like. So, okay, so take a look at this picture here, uh, go down. So click on that Facebook there. I'm gonna click on the first picture there. So you see that the panel, you've got an LCD screen, which is usable for input. You have a dial in there, you press button, you can select things from a menu. That's programmable within Marlin. Yeah, click on that first picture. Very convenient for the purpose of controls of any other machine. So now we're controlling the 3D printer or other CNC machines. But once again, as I mentioned, we can use this system uploading a different set of code to the Marlin controller through a USB port. And you can turn this, for example, into a brick press controller. Uh, because, for example, when we build the brick press controller, we have a dedicated one, uh, different parts, different components. Why not do the um, make this a multi-purpose thing. So that's that's exactly what we have done. And for example, it simplifies some things like on a brick press controller, you have different buttons, like say for manual control, you have buttons like joystick kind of buttons for uh, running the brick press in different directions. 
Or you have selection for the kind of pressing mode, like what kind of bricks you want to press. You can take care of all of that without adding any physical components by having an LCD screen. That's exactly what an LCD screen does. It allows you to have a button, selector, menus, and you can do all of that through a component that you're already using. So that's that's the next evolution for, say, Scott's brick press. You can select, okay, now get half bricks, full bricks, whatever, or test the machine or run, run a sample brick. You can do that all through that little controller, um, which has the brain power in, a, in an Arduino. The Arduino here is not shown. Aiden? See? Arduino. How would it know when to stop? Okay, uh, technical question. Huh? We can already make half bricks. Yeah, we can. The idea is, so Aiden, how do you tell? Right now, for the brick press, the control logic is by pressure only. So you're, you're detecting where pressure goes high means you've reached the end of the stroke. You measure that time through software. And then you say, oh, I'm going to go the full time to make a full brick, or I'm going to go half that time to do a half brick. And you can have that in the current code, we actually have it calibrate every single stroke. So depending on what kind of engine power unit you have, it will adjust the timing accordingly. Uh, this you can select, for example, through the LCD screen, you can say, oh, give me a full brick, give me a half brick or whatever. But doesn't that change over time with your power unit conditions? So uh, so it can change. I know you're measuring every stroke. I just wanted to know, is there data as to how that changes over time from the field? Like it shouldn't matter because we're measuring the time. If it's if it's thirty seconds for a stroke, if it's five seconds for a stroke, you're measuring it down to milliseconds. So it has it does work. We have done it. That's the way we've controlled the brick press in the latter iterations. When when it talk when you're talking about the motion, like how precise you want to get the motion of both cylinders, it's fine enough to like a fraction of an inch, like an eighth or something. So um, no issues with that. The controller itself is fast. It operates on, on a time clock cycles of megahertz. So to get millisecond control schemes implemented in software is very easy uh, using a controller. Um, so on a controller, what we'll do today is we'll actually build this thing. We um, First, I'm going to take this bent panel, and I don't have pictures on. We'll take some pictures today. And what I'll do is, as after we publish these videos, we can add links and maybe cut in some, do some little bit of editing to cut in other material into the, the videos. But we start with a bent panel. You see the bend right there. Uh, basically, it's perforations. Just draw holes into the CAD file. The CAD file is r right now downloadable in FreeCAD, so you can manipulate that. And this is all on a D3D V1904 page on a wiki. So uh, you can, and if you are confused about this D3, these D3D pages, the thing to look for all the time is ge we have genealogy pages. So for example, 3D printer genealogy, brick press genealogy, tractor genealogy, power cube genealogy. So you can find all this stuff uh, pending this basic understanding of the wiki structure, which confuses the hell out of me, but we're working on it. So holes for what we're doing is we're doing simple zip ties. All you see here is a bunch of components, and then you got a bunch of zip ties that put them on, and it's solid and stiff. What we have here is a small power supply. It's just a tiny 5 amp power supply that gets out, gets you both 24 and 12 volts. Uh, right now we're actually running the the Arduino controller on 24 volts. That power supply provides the electricity for the stepper motors when it's small stepper motors like NEMA 17, like on the 3D printer. And the trick is there, use a small power supply, don't send the power for the heat bed through the main power supply. Because you need a big power supply if you have a big big printer bed, printer heat bed. Uh, for us right now, we went to 120 volts because right now, get a load of this, the heat up time of the bed is faster than the actual nozzle. So we're right now using a 450 watt heater bed on 120 volts, which is about 12 feet of nichrome gauge 26 wire. Uh, we'll build that tomorrow. Uh, but this, the power handling element is this solid state relay in, a, in the corner here, which takes 120 volts from the grid and then it's 
it sends that through the heat bed. But the other side of the relay, what it is, is uh, it's a switch. It's a solid state switch, meaning a transistor based switch. Uh, meaning you're sending a little signal from the Arduino. The Arduino, the, the tiny little brain unit, it sends a signal through these, you connect the signal to those two buttons and then it switches a much larger load on a load on a load range of up to 40 amps. That one there is like 40 amps times 120, so it's, you can switch up to 5 kilowatts using that solid state relay. Uh, the bed itself right now is about 500 watts. Let's look at the plug here. So, do we have a picture of the plug? One feature, take a look at this detail feature. There. So behind, the <laughs> have a little cable binder behind there. So, so the, the, the power outlet there has a power cord. You wanna be careful about ripping it out. So we're doing that little nut catcher and a bolt to hold the wire right behind it, 3D printed. And the other th feature about the control panel is it has that rail here that you see that actually slides right onto the frame. It's got a little s slit in it. So, so the panel basically kind of like snaps in to the frame and you can take it out like that if you want to service it or repair it, modify it, and so forth. Oh, that's the back side of it. This was the process of building. Uh, print quality there is not good. I was using a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. You kind of have to get used to how that prints. Um, that's the that's the basic design there. Uh, we have some some more recent pictures. The the blank space on this. If you go to the, yeah the. So the screen is right down there. You have a knob to control the screen. The Arduino goes into that space right there. And one thing we found out, and this is for people replicating this, this was a trouble spot, you cannot power an Arduino through a 12 volt barrel jack in the system. You typically hear, oh yeah, Arduinos, yeah, you can do the 12 volt barrel jack on it. Uh, here it actually burns out the Arduino because between the screen I think it's, it's the screen and the shield, it draws enough current. We're talking about tiny current, like, like 200 milliamps, like a fraction of an amp. But that's enough to fry the onboard voltage regulator. So what we're doing right now is just stepping down, feeding the power directly into the Arduino through a 5 volt pin set. Uh, we'll show you that, but we're using just one little step down converter going from the power supply outlets which are there uh, feeding this little chip that feeds the power to the Arduino. Right into the terminal. Uh, it turns out that the end stop plugs are a 5 volt power source so we're actually connecting power through the end stop plugs on the ramps board. Um, so we're not using the USB port which is one way to provide power to the Arduino or the barrel jack which is a, another way to provide oh, power. <laughs> Yeah, you have to give power to the Arduino. The power up, the, the voltage level of the Arduino is 5 volts, so you have to, and it has its own onboard voltage regulator if you feed it with 12 volts, but we're finding they're burning out because we have the screen, and the screen draws enough current that it burns that out, and so it was one of the shakedowns for this control panel. Any questions on the control panel? When you do the um, 120 into the GFCI on the back, is that in those, is it a screw term or is it like a push in and lock? It's a push in plus screw. So it goes into a little hole and then it clamps down actually. And it's pretty, so it could work with stranded or solid and then do you have, um, wire. You throw it in there with the insulation as towards yeah, right, it goes right. all the way in. Do you, do it's stripped on it. Like, like, no, let's look at the back of the GFCI there. I think we had a picture there. Um, yeah, take a look at this picture. Put in the wires through those holes, okay. and that's it. So they're they're. You know, you go like three quarters of an inch in there, so you strip like a half inch 
or something, and then you clamp it down with those bolts there. So you just have to be really good with where you cut the insulation. It's forgiving because that hole is pretty deep. It's like an inch deep. So, okay, so very okay. easy to wire so you up. Can have insulation go into the hole. Yes. Okay. So it's not a, so no no of the power leads are exposed here. The other little feature on this here uh, is actually a wire cover there. So we throw the excess wire from the front of the control panel. Right now the printers that we are showing there they kind of have a. a a crow's nest of wires but when we tidy up the wires the wires actually go back and you kind of just tuck them into a compartment there there's like a cover we just snap on there uh, to hold them in place um, so pretty convenient like easy to take this thing off and what else what else to say about um, other questions on that on a control panel I don't want to be, uh, the relay. yeah if you can go back a couple pictures. Um, yeah. Put back to, uh, so what is the purpose of that relay? This one. The relay is a switch. It's like mm -hmm. a wall switch. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it takes a little signal from Arduino, which mm -hmm. is just a tiny right. five volt what signal. Is it switching on uh, In this case here, we're switching on a, f a 450 watt heat bed. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. So that's like a big, big light bulb. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to realize, I just wanted to know like, what is it used for in this setting. Yeah. It's solid state, so it has pretty much an infinite lifetime. It can switch on and off many times, millions of cycles. Mm -hmm. So you can also do pul the pulse width, like the rapid pulse width modulation kind of control uh, from that as well. Yeah. You don't need that for the bed, but... <laughs> Don't need it for the bed, but they do have a bed heating scheme where by using that rapid on and off, you can get it to be to go exactly to the set temperature and stay there. Oh, it wouldn't overshoot and then kind of come down and down. Mm -hmm. With a an, yes, a thermostat. It's an advanced thermostat. Thermostats don't work like that typically, because uh, thermostats are typically on off. Here you have the rapid cycling, which is called pulse width modulation. Um, that's built into Marlin, so you can control electrical loads very precisely so immediately what comes up here is oh how about a filament maker extruder filament making extruder yeah that's switching on a load on and off rapidly to get it to the just the right temperature oh, so, so this is already implemented that's implemented right now we don't have it turned on for the bed because we don't really need it right um, so the bed does overshoot, it overshoots, like if I set it at 72, it will go to 80, and then hold down to 72, and it turns on. So, um, a little sidetrack question, so just in the mind we saw, it looked like a uh, plastic extruder or filament extruder yeah. in the shop. Yeah. Is that something that you were successful in? in yes, we've successfully rolled out a couple of spools of ABS filament with that, so that works, works really well. Uh, we had it mounted on the wall in a vertical orientation, so and then put used. We used pellets. We did not use regrind. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't grind our own stuff at that time. Right. That was last year. We just did that quickly. But it's um, a controller like this basically controls a heater element like a nichrome wire yeah. for the heat barrel, or you can just get commercial heater elements in order to make a, a filament maker where you're melting plastic and extruding that. Did you print anything with that filament? I uh, haven't used it actually, okay. so we can. Yeah. We can take it out That's, and we can well, use it. The reason why I'm asking is because that is sort of like a, one of those, not critical, but sort of critical if you want to lower down the cost, right? Like doing the oh, it's absolute, and all absolutely. And, uh, and the research one. online that people were trying to do their own extruders was that they were not getting a consistent diameter and they were like tinkering in like a, a, a water bed that was cooling it off like there was a, all, all sorts of contra contraptions to make it in some people got some you know uh, um, some systems that were effective some some it was just like it was getting clogged in the um, in, in the um, I don't know, so what do you call it, the extruder because yeah. of the diameter uh, um, variation yeah. so yeah we're making three mil three millimeter filament <laughs> so that's easier than making 1.75 so we were getting three plus minus like 0.1 millimeter, mm -hmm. which is not good, but it's fine uh, for 
uh, getting decent printing. Yeah. It, that that distinction becomes less important for printing bulk things. Bulk, yeah. So the very good use case for DIY comes from big stuff, yeah. furniture, plastic lumber, where you don't care that you have a tiny little bump right. on your two by four. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be better than the stuff you get in the store anyway. Right. See, the, precision. The concern with that though is like a two by four made out of plastic <coughs> is that those individual layers have to be very well laminated. Like we've seen how things can come apart and then that's just no good. That's getting into enclosed chambers. Mm -hmm. If you do, Control we're printing at 20% infill. If you do 100% infill, that it's, it's a totally different story. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get that kind of laminate, delamination because you typically go like across one way, one layer, and then the next layer goes the other way. Mm -hmm. But the real deal there is enclo enclosures. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, especially for things that warp when they're when you're printing them. Like for example. Um, not polyethylene, but polypropylene. Yeah, polyethylene and polypropylene. Those things warp really bad in a heated chamber that solves that. Any other questions on the controller? Yep. So for scaling this? Yeah. How many amps can you can this scale to? The this system right now, so I haven't talked about the scalability of that, but instead of using the onboard stepper drivers which are tiny plugged right in there just take a wire to an external stepper driver so you can get whatever stepper driver exists we have used the Toshiba 6600s which are four amps each so you can run big stuff uh, whatever you want to connect to because those stepper drivers also take a little signal step direction enable and that is the output that comes out of this controller system so we can run any size of stepper motor with this um, haven't seen big ones there are I think well the Pololus they are open source you can copy that design exactly but big ones no not really uh, that's a missing link so once again for electronics designers a nice larger open source stepper driver is a good thing currently like I thought that was a huge deal a few years ago but you can get those Toshiba 6600 ones for eight dollars each so it's not prohibitive cost wise but once again to make it lifetime design and scalable to any value yes open source so inside of the stepper drivers can you speak to exactly what's going on Okay. Uh, inside the stepper drivers, what you're doing is you're sequencing, you basically, little control logic there sends out a signal that turns the windings in a stepper motor, fires them, in fires them in a particular sequence is it rapidly. All, it's doing increasing current? all it is, you can think of as a uh, is a pattern of transistors that mm -hmm. yes take a little signal and pulse it into pulse current and increasing I think the, the, the voltage I have a differing uh, understanding of it take it away uh, is that my understanding is that the drivers themselves have like a pin that is like up one step another pin that's like down one step or there may be some kind of a communication protocol for like one wire communication with a with a, with a processor or something you tell the chip to go up one step or down one step, and it takes uh, it takes current and turns it into. You may have seen on the on the motors. There's a couple of pins. Yeah, that's cool. So for everybody who doesn't, like there the wires come in pairs, and you run current through like this pair and then this pair and then this pair in order to to ratchet the motor like to this pair and then this pair and then this pair and then background the first pair or whatever because they they make it reuse. But the driver itself is responsible for turning the command to go up one step, up one step, up one step, up one step into this pair, now this pair, now this pair, and then now back into this pair or whatever. So it's responsible for turning the simple command of up one step into exactly which wires need to be turned off. So it takes the Direction output from the motion interpreter, which the microcontroller is doing, right? Yeah. That's the motion interpreter. Now, now that you say that. Outputting 
Yeah. Go to the so you can get the link and post it. Direction and enabled it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's more accurate than what I said. It's not necessarily an up and a down but and the drive. You can also do Microsoft. My yeah. Uh, I think that it takes the same uh, like up one step, down one step thing. However, it's phrased. Like I think, based on what you said, I, I, I'm recalling there may be a pin that is like in terms of direction, and another pin that says go stop, go stop, go stop. Or rather, for every time it turns on, it steps up, and then it turns off, and then it turns on and it steps, or something along those lines. But the the micro setting, I believe, is that. Each time that happens, it will turn another pair on a little bit more and turn this one off a little bit. Right, so it, it can kind of, instead of going from here to here, it can kind of transition the motor in small Okay, so there is a, there is, it's more than just, it, it's more than just like essentially three it's, it's got to be able to do it. Okay. I think that's where stepping, that's my understanding, because I was like, how, how does this work that it's so precise? And it's, it's what you, like what you said, it's like two sets of magnets are, are propelling it and the other ones are catching it. So it doesn't kind of like spin up and then go into the step. Electromagnets. Yeah, electromagnets, yeah. So essentially there's like one step and the other one is stopping it from like going out to one specified step. You know, then from, my, from what I've heard, uh, micro stepping does mean that your fork is a little bit less and you have a little bit more tendency to slip yeah. because it's trying to be prints at such a finer grind. Doesn't it also punt when you micro step? It might mean that. Because like it's not you're not it's not perfect. Like you're not locking it, it's not here. Well the you're playing with the 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 permanent magnet isn't here. It's in the shape. I mean it's not an actual gear. But you're playing with you're playing with magnetic and electric fields. It's not a mechanical device for no, no, turning no, no, stops. No, it's not, it's not. You have to you have to continually engage the magnetic fields to engage the, the, that location because I think you're going to do it. I think, I'm confident with it. And then I think uh, uh, it's going to like, like up, it's going to like try and try to find that like point of maximum flux or something. You're saying yeah. that it'll bounce a little bit? Yeah, like it's going to move. Yes. Yeah. Could be true, but not. Yeah. Um, and I think a motor controller is like an H bridge. Yeah, let's step out a little bit into more uh, more general things here. So that's good details. Details. Um, um, the relevant thing for people to know is that this system can control the motors at at full stepping and micro stepping, and. Um, you can go really, go really deep down that hole if you want to. The good thing is there are actually uh, on stepper motors, motors, which are a very useful thing. There is an there open is an source open stepper, stepper motor, motor, like a NEMA 17, um, on a wiki. Look at open, look at source, open source stepper, stepper motor. motor. I'm going to show that. Show that. Because I was because quite I was surprised, surprised to, see to see it. I'm getting booted out. out. In stepper In motors, stepper motors you, have you have two sets of two coil, sets of coil windings. windings. And there's a simple way, simple so this way. one guy one really, really hacked it. Hacked it. So he made a very, simple, made a very simple motor with a huge with a gear down. Gear down. Using a planetary, using a planetary gear, gear down. In fact, the split we're in a planetary gear down, which we're going to call it. Basically, 3D printed. Two. So he 3D printed this motor, and by having, by having a very simple very electric simple motor that spun motor that fast with a huge gear down, gear down, he was able to he use able ramps. To use he was actually using ramps to control that, control that precise stepping. stepping. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty so powerful. You have, you have, what you're doing is you're. Doing you're Turning, turning somewhat of somewhat a, re of a re <coughs> regular, regular, <coughs> regular, regular electric electric motor, motor, kind of a setup, a setup. and he put and it, he put I can't, it, I can't, I can't access, access the wiki right now for some reason. He put it in a form factor of a NEMA 17 motor, so it's, 
It's the same it's size, the same size as, as the motor. motor. By using a gear down, down, if you can if count the number of... <coughs> 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 Sorry, sorry. Um, um, fascinating thing fascinating for me on that was that, was that you're using you're ramps using to ramps control, to control a fast-moving fast motor, motor, but because of the gear down, you're, down, you're controlling it to very fine steps. So it was like, holy cow, this is cool. Because these split, 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 split ring planetary motors can get you huge get gear huge downs gear on the factors of hundreds, hundreds, and you have to kind of, you have to kind of scratch your head a little bit. How does that work? It's on the wiki. On the wiki. Look at Look split at ring split planetary, planetary open source open stepper, source stepper motor. motor. Take a look at this thing. Show the picture. Show the picture. Where's the picture? Where's the picture? Mm. Mm. There there was, it makes make your thing smaller. smaller. Open source open stepper source motor stepper. page on the wiki. This is valuable, this is valuable because, because, because pending, further pending further developments, further developments this is a practical matter. Uh, so the, oh, the so guy who did that, did that, let's see, where's the so like where's links the, like, or something? Or something? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Open source. Open source. Uh, uh, the driver? The driver? No, no. How about stepper motor? That was on the as well. Go to stepper, go to motor, stepper and motor and go and to, and to links. links. Send me some links. Send me some links. No, no, no. It's on the wiki, on the wiki somewhere. somewhere. But, but it looks like a regular step motor. The, the, the point to note about that is you're making a, making a a simple kind a simple of a motor, motor adding a huge gear down, down to it to make it function, make it function like, like a stepper motor. Step motor. So it's cheating. it's cheating. But it works on the but same principle as a stepper motor, motor because motor even though the stepper motor has many little little coils and it's a complex geometry, it's switching between two pairs at a time. So, so, point being, the, being the, ramps the ramps controller can take that if you have only you two have simple two coils, coils that make the motor move really, really fast, fast, but you're gearing it down, gearing it down and you get the functionality of a stepper motor. That means precision motion, precision motion. fully open source, fully open source. tool chain. I mean, is this also involve a change in software? Because part of the thing with a stepper motor is that they, they are continually energized, so you're always from power down. Yeah. So if you were to drive a, a normal motor with that, it would just continue to move, where a stepper motor would stay in place. Right, right, you're right. You're right. So, so I don't know the, the details of that one. one. But all I know is that he was using Arduino, the RAMS board, to control it. So, so um, um, I mean, I'm sure we're going to Yeah. Where, what I what I do all the time because I keep a good log on my march and log. Uh, there's a 3D printed stepper motor page. Ah, there it is. It's called 3D printed stepper motor. If you go to that, it's on Thingiverse. So you can so you can 3D printed stepper motor. Look at look at the Thingiverse link at the top. Look at this thing. Look at this. It's inspiring. It's inspiring. But it needs more work. It needs more work. It overheats. It overheats. So he's got so he's got two sets of coils sets of behind. Coils behind. All right. All right. Sure. Sure. And this thing and this does thing very does fine very stepping, fine. <laughs> spinning really fast. Spinning really fast. <laughs> but that gear down, that's a gear down in there, called a split ring planetary gear down, 3D printed. 3D printed. And that thing. That thing it's beautiful. So, so I came so to the guy, the guy hey, said, this thing hey, overheats, uh, got to uh, go to the next iteration. iteration. But this is a but perfect is a project out of the thousands of projects, projects to take on. Take on. Uh, because stepper uh, motors are very useful. They're, they're the core of, like, for example, imagine our 3D printer. Well, we are spending $8 on each motor. But here, here it's not so much about the price, but it is about the price when you go to much larger size. So you scale this up to ones that are pretty big. Which now start costing you hundreds of dollars. That's where the open source advantage takes kicks in, because you're producing that for a few dollars, like ten dollars. So you got coils, you got magnets, and you got three D prints. You got a bearing, bearing, and you've got little pieces of metal at a dollar a pound. So, so 
uh, worthwhile. worthwhile. So that's, so that's something, something to play to with, play with. Uh, and, and can be controlled. That was controlled that there. Controlled that thing was controlled with ramps. ramps. Okay. okay, using ramps. Using so ramps. let's go to, so a, let's go to a, a, picture a picture of the ramps, the ramps. William, the, William other the other one, this one, this one. Mm -hmm. just a little bit just of little bit of some practical, 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 practical skills, skills here. So, skills here. so not that one, not that, that one, one. That one. Mm. Mm. Here, I, here, I. So that's the so ramp. That's, that's the ramp after that's, this thing has been finished. Finished. We're running, we're running. That's the power supply here. Here, two sets of wires. There's a label there. Twelve volts, twenty-four volts. But from this power supply, we're putting on twelve volts and twenty-four volts. Uh, you can uh, hack, the, hack the, the ramps board, ramps board, board on, 24, on 24, but you have to make some you have to make changes. You would cut out this cut little, out one, little one power, power connection. connection. And besides, and besides that, that, it actually, it actually pretty much pretty works, works as, as, it. as it. We're feeding 12, we're feeding 12 volts, volts for some of the systems, some of the systems. And, and 24 volts for the stepper drivers. Other parts, like other parts, 24, 24 also goes to the heater, extruder heater, heater, fans, fans. Uh, but the real uh, deal the is real here, is here. Small, power small power supply because this thing, this thing, out of this, out of this, uh, uh, this, uh, actually the heat bed one, one is, is, is that that one here? That one here? That's the that's heat bed. bed. That's the pin that's set. The pin this, set. This, this little terminal little here. Terminal here. Those, those are your little tiny wires. wires. But you're sending, you're sending to the big switch. So now you can now control loads of power from a tiny microcontroller. Can you keep that one ten or is it twelve? One ten. One twenty. Four hundred fifty. Watt. Watt. Meaning we're just switching like four amps, three four amps. Well, if it was twelve, you'd be switching what forty? Forty? Thirty? Forty? Thirty? Forty? That means a much bigger power supply than this. So we're taking grid power. This is our this plug. Is our that's plug. that's a very proud three D printed plug. It's custom, it's custom because, because <laughs> it's got it's regular got regular terminals. You plug it in. You got the tiny got the little, little one twenty coming, coming, coming out of that to feed the power supply. Power supply. You get you get quarter quarter, uh, and quarter and inch by sixteenth inch stock stock master car in brass. Cost of cost of cents. <laughs> well, well, a thing of like twelve inches, inches in that would be like a like buck. Um, 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 it's actually it's cost actually competitive. competitive. It's probably, it's less, probably less, less than a dollar in materials there. there. But you can get a plug for a dollar, so that's not a big deal. But the big deal is that the plug actually has two wires coming out of it. One running directly to the it kind of curves around down there. To the heat bed, the heat bed switched, switched, so it goes to this, this, this terminal, terminal, and then internally and it's switched and goes to the bed. And it's, that wire is actually going through the control panel. But that's oh, beautiful. That's it's got two, two pieces, pieces of clamp, clamp with a little with screw, screw, screw to screw it down. Screw down. And, and it's a custom, it's a custom thing. thing. You can't you get a thing like that. that. We'd have to we'd hack a block to do this. So in order to make this presentable, look decent, otherwise this would be worse. Well, I mean, where do you... Uh, okay, um, primarily, primarily about this was that, was that a typical plug would stick, stick out a bit. bit. So first, first of all, we turned it at a right angle. angle. But the second the thing second is you have two sets of wires going out, out, out of it. One is a one tiny set of wires. Set of wires. You cannot you buy can't a plug like that. They don't exist. So you make it, you make 3D printed. It doesn't exist. So one is the bed and the other, this red and black here is the power for the power supply. Yeah, which yeah, is a which tiny, is like, like one amp, one amp, tiny little wires, it's wires, still 120 right there. Right there. So he's, he's, um, yeah, yeah, very convenient. Very convenient. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But, I mean, but I mean, from here, from here, here power supply, power supply to then on, you then go on, to 12 and 24. And, and then, as we found out, this, this here, here, this fries your Arduino. It's a barrel jack going from 12 volts. Don't do that. Don't do that. Try to couple. Try to couple. Uh, turns uh, out turns you blow out, out, blow out the, the, the voltage regulator on Arduino, which you can bypass, you can bypass. or you can or actually, you can actually if, if you have a blown voltage, voltage regulator, regulator, I'm still using the blown board, board, and I'm feeding, and feeding it, it right there with 5 volts, through, another step down. through, through a, step a step down, 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 down this 12 this tiny little strip for a dollar, mm -hmm. two pin, two pin in, two pin out, from 12 to 5, it's adjustable so you can set it from 0 to 12. Uh, we uh, have, we have, it's so tiny it's so that actually we put it right there and there put a zip tie around, around it, around it. Using, using the, the those bend holes. Bend holes. Yeah. So they actually, yeah. 
um, um, more about more about so, so, so we know you cannot see here it's under the ceramics board uh, uh, Arduino or the blue blue, blue board board this is part this of the Arduino, of Arduino and the valve jack is part of the Arduino, otherwise you cannot see, see it. This plug comes this out, comes out, so plug the power, the power, there's power, a power, SD card, there, card for there for feeding information to the 3D printer, that's how you, that's how you, you give it the files. You, files. you can, you can uh, I guess, uh, I guess. Can you upload can you programs to the SD as well? Does anyone know? I don't know. Uh, typically, uh, you typically program you the program Arduino by, by sending the code sending through the USB. USB. Uh, I mean, you could, you could probably program the Arduino to do it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't really yeah. have commonly done. Yeah, it's not yeah. a common thing, but I bet you can hack it. That if you're, um, if you're um, programming, programming, say you want, say you want a different a machine. machine. Here, here, here's a brick press, press, and it says D card. <laughs> Because the entire program will be on there, so you don't even have to use that uploading your code to your computer. So you can say, uh, provide a kit where you have uh, a code that runs the brick press and you insert it right there. So now this is my brick press chip, and you have the 50 machines on. This is my induction furnace. Michael, Michael. Really good, really good. Like, that's how you get the code program from the USB drive instead of running. And like my program and all this, minuscule. Uh, so I'm just getting into it, but I wonder if you rewrote the bootloader to like look for an SD card and then reprogram off the SD card onto the Arduino itself because you have to have a little bit of code to mm -hmm. get that started, get that off. Because that's what it's doing with the USB because you can also program direct via right. yeah, serial code. Yeah. And you can just bypass the bootloader and use the entire yes. memory on board memory. So maybe, maybe. Uh, that sounds about right. I would say that's Arduino, not 101, but 401. That's graduate study <laughs> Arduino level. Yeah, but yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once you, you understand, understand this kind of stuff, stuff. For, example, for example, people don't use. Don't, this is a, Arduino's an 8 bit, bit per se processor. Michael Steele is correct. Yeah, yeah. So sure. There's. there's did they do it with the Yeah, they. Yeah, they. Yeah, they. Yeah, they organized it. So just like, so just when, like you, when you boot up your computer, up your computer uh, it has to uh, go has to, to its, its, its bootloader or booting like sequence, BIOS. 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 You can kind of play with the same thing on Arduino, Arduino where you, where you can, can tell it to, to, to get information or its running code from a different source than like the USB port. Yeah, so that's a cool Here's a brick press. $5,000 right here. For a little card. Oh, no, you have to have some oh, hardware to go along with, with it, but if that hardware has hardware visual files to produce it off your CNC torch, torch table, then that could be a $1,000 SD card. So, so. Yeah, that's what you're saying. $45. $30 for this, that, that, and this. $5. $5. Ten dollars. $10. Ten dollars for GFCI. GFCI. And one dollar for the plug. 3D printed print part there is under a dollar. It's like, like maybe like, like 70 grams. Rates. So it's probably it's probably a dollar or under, under a dollar. Um, um, as you see as you here, the, here the, this mounts this on the mounts frame, on kind of snaps, snaps into the snaps frame because it's got those rails. Got those rails. So you can so convenient you can take this off, off, like say you know you want to repair the bed. Uh, question? Uh, question? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I noticed that with the, I mean, I, I mean, three printer. I think a lot of the the, the uh, uh, advantages that you talk about are being able to be able to plug in and work even more around. You know, and that is that is a huge advantage. Um, um, a lot of things like that on the market that are that are commercially available need certain like safety specifications. Like um, it's not any CS for like buildings, but like. Um, like maybe like SCC or, um, or not even SCC, I'm trying to think of UL? UL. UL, UL. 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 yes, thank you. UL, this UL. 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 type stuff, type stuff. How, how, how is, are there thoughts about, you know, like, UL listing 
certification. Yes, for, yes, for, absolutely. I absolutely. I mean, if we take if this we take to this commercial grade, grade, like if this is more popular than DIY, DIY that's part of the thing to crowdsource. For example, for the cordless drill, we're going to get go through the certification so that the people who replicate that, we have that for everybody. You need to do that only once. You pay for it once, and the value of that is infinite from that point. But that's just the cost of doing business, part of the process of, of product development. Yeah. Definitely. People ask the question a lot, but but the answer is always you just do what the system does, but you open source that. And and of course the the more tricky thing, like for example, getting a structural engineer to sign up on buildings when it's like a almost like a blanket license. Culturally, it's a shock for most engineers. Like a lot of people will be like, "Well, I can't sign up on that because of my my credibility or whatever," because because then they can be liable if somebody builds something that they've certified. So there's trickiness on that first getting an engineer to work with you because you have to understand how the, the whole open source framework works. It's a big a big mystery for most people. So it's that's a block. But over time, as we get people to, to collaborate, that won't be an issue. For example, the guy is interested. One German guy, architect, is interested in designing the next brick press brick home that we're building in Belize. And he said he'd actually do the certification for that, or the, not certification, but structural engineering, like actually signing off on the structural engineering of that. So that's that's awesome. I've never had anybody offer something like that. Uh, that would be great, but that's coming from a public contribution that will be pretty much in the public domain. So now with that, it just facilitates your entry to the say the building codes. Like okay, you have the actual engineering. Well, you might have to get a permit on top of that, but you have the supporting paperwork to say hey, this is what this does. Here's the calculations and so forth. So you have to go through all of that. You don't want to be killing people. Basic wiring of the controller. What else to say about it? The LCD screen plugs in and this L-shaped connector. That's that's actual LCD screen cables. Uh, that's all there is on that. For the power supply, you have two power leads at 120 coming in and four coming out. This bottom pair at 24 volts, I believe. Oh, can't really see. Yeah, something like that. Uh, it might be, it might be the other way around, but it's 12 and 24 outlets on that. They're labeled in tiny print, and here that's labeled right there. But that's the 12 volt side, and that's the 24 volt side that we're feeding in. But once again, don't do that barrel jack. It will work without the LCD screen, likely, but not with it. Um, solid state relay has a small signal going into it, and and a, it's switching a large load on the other side. For the ground fault connection interrupter you have just a power cord, two leads, no ground going into it. The GFCI does not accept the ground, but we can probably take the third ground wire from the frame and ground it without hurting the system. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that any time, yeah, but it doesn't do anything. Because if there's a leak, the GFCI will detect it anyway, right? So there's no point to even connect the, unless the GFCI breaks, but if the GF, GFCI breaks, its indicator light will not be green. It has a self-test function. There's two buttons on it. One is test and one is reset. So as long as the green light is on and power is on, I'm not even sure there's a case for grounding the frame. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah. Um, what else? So connect connections on the ramps itself, what do you have? The main things are stepper drivers, stepper, sorry, stepper motors. The drivers are these things with a little heat sinks on them. There's five of them. What we're doing is x-axis on the first one. We've got the extruder on the second one. We've got two of those dedicated to y. So we got y1, y2. And then there's z. On the z, there's two sets of pinouts, pins that you can connect two of those axes. Uh, but for the y, we actually took a separate stepper location and connected one motor each to that. So you've got those four pin connectors, that's for the stepper motors. The end stops go on these, these ones here. Thermistors are here in this row here. So here you see the bed thermistor. The one for the extruder is not connected. So you've got two temperature sensors. One, you have to give feedback on how hot the extruder is. 
you have to ha give feedback on how hot the bed is. So you got two two thermistor wires that are connected. Um, other connections on that. Say you wanted to do spindles or turning on say gas uh, oxy hydrogen or oxy fuel torch gas. You can dedicate an output here. Like for example, you can say. Uh, you can reprogram and you can say, oh, I'm going to make that the spark igniter for the torch table and I'm going to make that output the gas turn on for cutting and so forth. So you can reprogram this, but that wouldn't be really, uh, yeah, you'd have to hack up Marlin to do that kind of stuff. Or you can just use a very basic Arduino code without using because that has a lot of stuff in there under Marlin. Marlin's a pretty long co piece of code um, which can which controls like all these advanced functions like bed leveling and uh, retraction of the filament like every time uh, you jump over uh, a space you retract a little bit of filament so you don't get uh, excess filament like there's a lot of, lot of little functions but you can also as is leaving that board on top you can use the Arduino underneath, program that, and it can still use some of the functionality of this, because all these pins here are typically connected to some pin on the Arduino. So you can leave that there, or you can take it off and work with Arduino pins directly to get various inputs, outputs. The idea is that Arduino Mega has like 50 pin, pins on it that you can control things with. So principally you can control some Rube Goldberg machine that's got 50 moving things um, off a single Arduino Mega. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Marlin? Is that Marlin is the code. What, you, what does it look like or what is it? What's what it look like? What is it? What you can take a look at it here. You, yeah. Like, Marlin is... You find it earlier and I just wasn't not really. Uh, we talked about that Marlin is the control code, the firmware that goes on the controller to run the 3D printer. That's a code that's a 3D printer controller code. Um, and it's it Marlin? Marlin is somebody, like... Somebody like, wrote and like, this is just the body of code that runs. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a well-known open source project. Okay. It's one of the perhaps most downloaded projects on this planet because how many people have 3D printers? Just about everyone who has a pre 3D printer downloads that because uh, okay. It's the most popular okay. one. Okay. Uh, it's most common. We use that. It's fully open source. Oh, it's gold five, Marlin. Yeah. Everyone uses Marlin. Prusa Printers uses Marlin. That's a modified version of it. Uh, I think another one that, at least I think I have on one of my printers is, uh, I don't know how to say it. Like Repeteer. Repeteer. Yeah, Repeteer. There's other ones. There's a bunch well, yeah, of them. Even Repetier uses Marlin. Repetier is the <laughs> Repetier is the graphical user interface, and it interfaces with Marlin in the background. Oh, okay. So yeah, um, question. So, so if you wanted to control more than uh, six motors or five motors or yeah. what have you, um, so you got the Arduino mega board. Yeah. Then you have the tape, which is the what was the other board that goes on top Ramps, of it's called, the, the red, red one is called the ramps board. They're called shields. Anything can go back to right. the okay. future. Okay. It's a different terminology. Yeah, I'm familiar with, uh, I'm familiar with like uh, Beagle Bone Black and they call it yeah. tapes. Same right. idea. Yeah, Another so donor board that goes on, on top of it. Right. So can you just stack more? Is that the idea? You can. Let's, let's say if I want to have 50 motors, would I just keep on stacking those uh, those uh, um, tapes? You need like four pins per motor, right? right, so here what, what's happening, yeah, you need like three or four pins per motor that you're taking from the Arduino Mega and connecting to those. And you're controlling those chips, those five chips there. Mm -hmm. Now this is the this is the shield for Arduino in this case. You can put on a different one. We're not really going into that right now. If we wanted to do like more more than five, like, yeah. what I would do here is use some of these other pins. <coughs> There's a bunch of other pins that are still excess, and then connect these things, which need three connections. These things mean external like stepper drivers. drivers. Or, uh, uh, pull up a Toshiba 6600. So you can 
instead of whatever, um, there's like three active, three or four active pins that mm -hmm. activate that. Connect those through a wire, yes. Mm -hmm. Connect those through a wire to a larger stepper driver, TB6600. Mm -hmm. You can connect one of these. These are larger, much larger, heavier. Oh, I have one of those from China. Yeah. This, you take. There's like direction, enable, pulse. pulse. So you connect like three or four of these. There's some of them are connected to one another, like we have the diagram. But you plug in those three wires and then some uh, into that, and now that's running. Now, this also needs power, so this would have a separate power supply. Right. And then you're controlling the stepper motors, the two sets of coils for the stepper motors with four wires coming here, one, two, three, four. And then they've got ground and voltage, so that's the power to the stepper driver. And you got the two pairs of coils that go out to the stepper motors. So all you need to do for the ramps here is take either take out one of those stepper drivers off the ramps and plug that in. But if you need more than five, let's right. say, yeah, that's use some of those excess pins. Uh -huh. uh, I think there's enough there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about the pinout exactly yet. Uh, we haven't really needed more than five mm -hmm. steppers at this time. If you do, if we did need like 20 of them or something or whatever, um, that which 50 pins can hold from the Arduino Mega, then we'd connect directly into those Arduino Mega pins, those three connections. Okay. Uh, and then you have to program the Arduino Mega accordingly. Because what the... Yeah, yeah. It would be a different program than Marlin, but you'd have to modify basically okay. custom code. Right. Yeah. Um, so when you have two motors on one axis, yeah. are, they, are they in parallel or is it two different outputs? No, parallel. Parallel because you want to have them exactly step exactly. the same thing. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. The Z is exactly what it does. Uh, the Z on the, go back to, to that one. When you look at the Z, Those two sets of four pins, those are the same connections, just broken out into two sets of four. So that one stepper driver is doing both of those. So when we're actually connecting our Z-axis, Z we're going to use those. They're actually the same thing. They're off that little stepper driver there. For the Ys, we have two separate ones because we wanted more power in them. The Z, Z moves very slowly and doesn't do a lot of motion. <coughs> yeah. So we wanted to give, give some beef to the Y-axis. And the x-axis is lighter, so it's, it makes sense. The y-axis carries both the y and the x-axis, so they, they kind of need to be strong. The y just carries that, the, the x there just carries the x carriage. So the y's need more, more strength than the x. So that's why we have two. Um, what else to say about it? Let's see, we got, we're at 3 p.m., maybe start wrapping it up here, but maybe wrap up with a couple of things. Um, hackability of ramps, uh, I mentioned about the screen itself, you can repurpose it to do whatever you want to be a selector for your brick press or whatever, the powerful concept of, yeah, the bootloader stuff, and you, here's your brick press on a chip, uh, that's a good thing. Um, you can, right now, make your own Arduino boards, the blueprints are open. And you, if with our CNC circuit bill, you can do it, but you have to use a socket for one of those chips. You want to pull up one of those chips because that's actually pretty important. You can make your own Arduino for, with a chip that costs about a dollar or a fraction of a dollar. The CPU on an Arduino is, is inexpensive. Uh, so pull up the Atmeg with the big legs. There's one. There's one type of the Arduino chip. Uh, I'm not sure it's the Mega one for the Mega, but but. One of the other Arduinos, they have these chips. They have different form factors of chips. They have one version that's got, I think, the 0.1 inch spacing between leads. That you can mill readily with our CNC circuit mill. So if we wanted to, yeah, that, that style one. Uh, that you can put on a board, mill it out, get, do all, you know, put some more components around that, and you have that microprocessor. So that's basically like a little computer. Um, it costs. What does it cost? Uh, 75 cents. 78 cents. Yeah. So you can build your own microprocessor, microcontroller, 
for a dollar plus some other components. Uh, the designs are out there. The, the, the Arduino is... Yeah. Yeah, the Arduino is open source. The chips themselves are not open source. Um, right? The chip, like what's inside of that chip? That one's not open source, but the LegalBone is. The actual schematic? Yeah, everything's open source on LegalBone. Okay. Okay. That's no, actually pretty good. Actually, yeah, I didn't really know of that. I just no, found that. Well, I, so I think the chips are still proprietary, but the circuit design is maybe open. No, not yet. You don't want that yet. But they say there was an argument that it's more open source. It is more open source because it's more of the components. Okay. Um. Let's see. Um. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a general overview, kind of running out of time here, but uh, we'll be fleshing out this this design guide here. We'll be at, probably at, one of the next steps will be to uh, reformat the CV press controller around this. We still need a nice weatherproof enclosure. So this system that we showed, that goes on a 3D printer. It's not outside in the elements, so it's not protected from rain. If we did something like the drip press controller, yeah, you, we'd have to either 3D print another type of uh, enclosure design because this one will not do that. It doesn't have the structure. <laughs> you can't hang it on a brick press. Um, so one great project would be to design an open source enclosure that can handle pretty much this system. And in a brick press, what you have, instead of a solid state relay, uh, do uh, CB press genealogy just to show you the brick press controller right now. Let's let's do a comparison. Here's the brick press controller. How we're doing it right now versus okay. How does it look like if we modify the ramp our 3D printer controller to do that? So what we what do we need to do? Uh, so go to CB press controller v1901. So this is hot off the press, and this controller is on the the Belize machine right now. This machine is in Belize, and this is what we'll be doing, but here's what we have. It's, it's a very basic thing, but you got your Arduino here, and all it's doing is sending out those little signals are the outputs. Okay, underneath is the Arduino. This is a shield. It's a relay shield. On the current, they're solid state relays, actually. So, Go up, go back to the So that's cool, it's in a, in a weather enclosed box. Here's selection for the different brick pressing modes, like one is full brick, zero is off, one is full brick, so two is half brick, and so you, forth. When do you measure the full stroke under the, for the pressing mode? When you finish your press, do you drop all the way back down? Yes, then you do. All the way back up? Is that when you no, you, you measure, so the geometrical relationship is known. You, measure you, you measure it all, all the way down. Okay. Who had the insight to do that? I did. Okay. And then you had Abe do the... Um, I don't know if his name was on Yeah, he's, we, we all worked on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer concept. Just measure the time of the stroke. There's no, I didn't, it's not my idea. It's a, it's a universal idea. Um, yeah, so you measure the stroke going down, but the, the length of the stroke going up is different because then you have the piston in the way. Yeah, but there's a very clear geometrical relationship. It's all the fluid minus the volume of the shaft. So you can calculate, calibrate the motion of this exactly. <laughs> so in this system, so yeah, that's why I use the jack, okay? So product ecology, use that jack, it works here. We get 12 volts into the Arduino, it works in this case. So this is powered by a 12 volt battery. Um, this is our shield, this is our Arduino. So if you put them side by side, well, we already have the Arduino. Well, let's see, people, would you mind uh, putting that in the chat box for the remote people to see? Oh, um, uh, so the, that address. Okay. So we have the Arduino already in our ramps controller. We have only one of those solid state relays, um, but that's one. We can actually, well, the solid state relay we have on the Arduino, uh, on the, uh, the printer controller is AC. Here we're, in the brick press, we're just running uh, controlling cylinders through DC solenoids. So this, the relay set on the brick press controller is just, you know, still a relay but a different kind of relay and there's four of them on a single board, right? So 
What's the best way to do that? That's essentially the function. You've got that selector. The selector will be replaced by the LCD screen, so you don't need it. Can you go back to the, the picture of that? Because I want to make an analogy to all that. That is your LCD screen. That is your Arduino already exists, and then there's just terminals, so connections. There is your relay. We have one relay right now. We can take that one out and put four little ones. So maybe like modify the control panel that we have right now with like four more holes for four of these little guys. Or maybe just this same board uh, instead of that one relay that we have there right now. So the only modification between the printer controller and this is the fact that you're going to add this board uh, to our 3D printer controller. One way to do it is right on top of the Arduino. Unplug the, the RAMS board, plug in that, you're done. So basically it's like, cool. That means the design, like all this, these are all other components. We're getting rid of all of them and replacing, adding this one component to an existing system, as opposed to adding all these components to make this device. So there is a case for a universal controller. I think I'll stop at that, but you can play like that. But for us, it's really attractive because then instead of having two, two bills of materials, you kind of have one, you degenerate into, you reduce the part count significantly. And that means you can manage that. If this thing breaks, you don't have to have that specialized button. You have the same parts as elsewhere. So you probably have spares of those because you use them in other machines. So from the standpoint of, of maintainability and lifetime design, this absolutely makes sense to, do, to go universal on that because you see there's just basic kinds of functions and basic kinds of components that we can repurpose to many different things instead of doing a dedicated design for everything. So it's resource efficient. What kind of shield is that? It's called a solid state relay shield. Oh, okay. So it's still Arduino, Mega, and then just the solid state. Yes. Solid Underneath, actually, you see the Mega. That's actually the Mega down there. The shield itself, it's right there. Okay. It plugs okay. into the top part. Is that a design, or is that a design? Off the shelf. Oh. Off the shelf, easy design. This, this actually did not exist when we did the brick pressing 20, 2008. We would have used that, and that's why we did our own Detroit board, which was essentially that but now you can get these things cheaply off the shelf for like five bucks so i mean this controller yeah that's that's the comparison that's what we did before that's our design william did that uh, I've heard you. What? yeah that's the old controller in 2008 yeah. 2011 they used that yeah there we used the another arduino which is not the mega but it was arduino uno uh, Refined to this, so this is clean and easy to build. Like, I would say quite replicable with all off the shelf parts, no custom boards. Arduino you get for five bucks, this board you get for five bucks, and otherwise a switch like ten dollars or so, and an enclosure. But we could definitely use 3D printed enclosures for this, so one good project would be to design a, the universal controller that's within a 3D printed enclosure that's waterproof for, for outdoor uses such as the brick press. Where did the CME come from? We did it. It's a lo basic logic and so it's I'm simple. Hmm? What was it in? Code, it's an Arduino language, language which is... Subset of C. Oh, wait. Huh? <laughs> C? Yeah, subset of C. Subset of C you use for Arduino. Uh, yeah. Okay. Arduino has a relatively simple kind of a deal. Yeah. So, any questions from the remote people, real quick? Um, yeah. Maybe not really. Any other questions here? I think we're good. Let's uh, let's continue in the workshop then. Thank you, everybody. Remotely, we'll be back 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Is there a question? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. We're going home. <laughs> I want to go swimming now. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. We got a pool. It's not yeah, hooked up. Okay. <laughs>